Hello and welcome to Small But Mighty, Cape Through Lens of a Smaller EPP. My name is Chris Cook. I am president of CAPE. I have been with CAPE since 2015. Uh, prior to that, I was commissioner in Illinois for a number of years and a former teacher. I have taught both elementary and high school students. Also was a director, uh, administrator of special education for the state of Illinois. Um, wanted to give you a little background uh, overview of CAPE. Uh, CAPE, of course, is a result of the merger of NCAPE and TIAC in 2013. We serve over 700 providers nationally and internationally, and about a third of our providers are considered smaller in size. We are also and have been recognized by the Council for Higher Education Accreditation since the formation of CAPE in 2013. What that means is we also have someone looking over our shoulder and asking us to report annually, and we have a lot of requirements to ensure that we are a quality accreditor as a result of that. We also have partnerships with 13 specialized professional associations, and we currently have agreements with 34 states that help uh, streamline the accreditation process and often syncs that with what the state approval process is. And I'm joined today uh, by Dr. Melina Monaco, my vice president, and I'll have her introduce herself. Melina? Hi, I'm Melina Monaco. I'm the vice president of accreditation at CAPE. And uh, before that, I was the Director of Knowledge Management and the CAPE Coordinator at a large uh, R1 institution and had been a reviewer and lead for CAPE uh, for several years before transitioning to CAPE Headquarters. And Shannon? Hello everyone, my name is Shannon Cuff. I am the Associate Provost for Adult Online and Graduate Education at Drury University. Just prior to accepting this role in January, I served as the Dean of the School of Education and Child Development. I enjoy working with CAPE in my various roles. I enjoy serving as a reviewer and am really excited about sharing what we do to make it work at a small EPP. Tracy? Hi, I'm Tracy Tuttle. I am the Director of Teacher Preparation Programs and the Department Chair at Muskingum University. We are a small EPP in Ohio. Um, we have recently submitted our interim advanced standards review. So that is our most recent experience with CAPE. And I have been serving as a reviewer for the CAPE accreditation process as well. And I'm excited to be here. Thank you both for joining us. We're then gonna start with the first question. And I think Shannon will just have you start with it. Just describe the size of your preparation program and how you approached or are approaching CAPE accreditation. So we just completed our site visit in October of 2020. So we are thrilled to have concluded the process, but really enjoyed the process of getting to that point. So the size of our preparation program comes from two different functions at Drury University. One is a traditional residential day program and the other is our evening and online program. So we train teacher candidates in both parts of what we do at Drury University. Uh, we have about 100 day residential students in our programs right now and about 175 in our evening and online. Those are all initial programs at Drury University and comprise elementary, middle, high school certification areas in addition to special education. So in terms of completers, we take that group and average anywhere from about 90 to 100 per academic year. And we move through the process through thinking about various things related to accreditation. So the size is small. Uh, but we also approach it from a very unique perspective in the sense that we really value the skill sets that our faculty and administrative staff bring to the accreditation process. So for us, it's about identifying who does what and who does what well. And so the idea of delegation and working as a faculty and staff collectively, talking about the accreditation process all along the way, was really instrumental to getting to October of 2020. And so we were able to divide and conquer and work together and share updates on what we were doing in each of the standards, how we were responding and overlapping in some of our data related to quality assurance. And as we moved together and looked at our data, 
We were also able to disaggregate data based upon the day in residential and evening online, and then also aggregate data where appropriate to make sure that we could make sense of our data as it responded to our different preparation programs. Thank you, Shannon. Tracy? So Muskingum University is similar, but uh, smaller in size. Uh, we have about 13 initial uh, programs, and that includes students in our undergraduate, our adult program, and some of our graduate programs, depending on the licensure area. Um, we also have four advanced programs that include educational leadership programs. Um, we have approximately only 60 to 70 completers per year across all of those programs. So although we offer a variety of programs at different levels, we don't always have a large uh, number of completers to look at data um, in a traditional fashion of a larger institution. Um, so we do look at those main programs and um, branch out accordingly for the other programs and, and how we support all of them. Um, like Shannon was saying, delegation and everybody participating is key. So it is a regular part of our department meetings that we talk about accreditation and our quality assurance system. Uh, we try and make sure everybody knows the verbiage, knows roughly what are included in the standards. There's no quizzes. We don't uh, get anybody on that note, but as new initiatives come up or new opportunities come up, we do look at this would be a great example of how we really do embody uh, the principles in standard two, or um, this, is, this just really shows how our quality assurance system is working. So this would be a perfect example to keep the standard five. So it's not just in preparation for the next review. Our last review was in 2017. Um, so ours is, I don't wanna use the word looming, but it is coming up that it is on our radar, but we keep it as a regular component. Um, we also try and target uh, something in preparation each semester. So last summer, because of the COVID issues we were having, we really did take a look at our field and how we were supporting field and cooperation in our field. So we did some work um, over the summer and all of our, our department um, and stakeholders were involved in that process. We took on uh, the advanced programs and really uh, looking at those in the fall in preparation for submitting the interim advanced review. Uh, so something is always on our agenda or on, on target to be reviewed, and we are including everybody in that process. Thank you, Tracy. And while we have you, we're going to go to the second question. As a small provider, what advice do you have for other similarly sized providers going through the process? Um, so using all of the resources that you have available to you is really key. Um, we are lucky that the state does have some support networking for our accreditation specialists in all of the ETPs with teacher preparation program, programs. And so we do stay active in those state resources. Um, we treat it like grant work at our institution. So it, it has to be um, a regular component that again, you are held accountable to and you are using as a regular part of your process. And I think the biggest thing um, is to volunteer and having not just one, but multiple uh, people in your program volunteer with CAPE. It provides a unique perspective and expertise that sometimes you don't have when you're just a program trying to go through the handbook and figure it out, figure out what it is you need to do. So volunteering in several capacities, and there's multiple ways you can do that with CAPE um, is extremely important. Thank you. Uh, Shannon? I would certainly agree with what Tracy uh, says. Volunteering has become really important to our small EPP as well. Uh, we have a very small number of faculty who work very hard to put accreditation together, and the more people who are versed in the standards, the better. Uh, also leveraging the opportunity that you have with the, your state relationship is key. So, so much of the information that we have, we would start with our state education folks to see what data they had to support our efforts. And so that could be anything for us from placement data. So we get information from our state about where our completers are teaching after their first year out in the field, we get a list of where they are and where they're teaching and what they're teaching. 
uh, that communication with the state is very key in the types of data that they may already have that you can then look at and review uh, to help prepare those different parts of your report. Uh, the other thing that I would say is that I'm a big fan of CapeCon. So live it up at CapeCon and go to those sessions. They are long days, but the networking is key. I think that the presenters that Cape carefully selects have a lot of great information. They are very willing to share models of what they have done to help get them to where they are. Uh, they're very free in sharing advice and knowledge. And I found sometimes turning to the person next to me was a really great opportunity just to brainstorm some ways to approach the standard. And so I've always found CapeCon to be a really useful, beneficial opportunity. And so I would encourage folks who are going through the process to think about that as a key part of professional development. Thank you, Shannon. And, and I'll add one thing um, about uh, just ideas about communicating. So I, mean, I think communication is a key element um, for success, whether you're large or small but um, engaging uh, CAPE with questions and, um, and emails and uh, at CAPECON, um, those are ways that you get your questions answered and um, can move forward. So, you know, don't, uh, don't feel like that you're, that you're bothering people or that you're, you know, continually asking questions. That's, that's the whole point. Um, we want your questions answered. So, you know, being able to communicate openly with, with CAPE at any point during your process, I think is also a, a critical component for success. And Melina, could you talk uh, a little bit about the cohort model you're using as people are going through? Yeah, so um, every semester I'm meeting with um, each of the EPPs that are going through that particular semester. Um, so we start with when the shells open um, in Ames, which is about 18 months before the um, site visit date, uh, site visit semester. Um, and so we're having these um, webinar meetings uh, now because everything's virtual um, with each of the cohorts answering questions about where they are in the in the process. Uh, so I just finished up actually the spring 2022s. We've done um, uh, this current semester, spring 21, working on fall 21, uh, and we're getting ready to open shells for fall 22, if you can believe it. Um, and so th that will be the next group that, that I meet with. So um, again, just touching base, making sure that folks are, are on target and uh, know their dates. Um, uh, when things are due and, and to ask questions so that they, they can have complete reports and, you know, uh, quality uh, timelines for, for getting their accreditation work done. Thank you. Sure. We'll go to the third question and we'll start again with Shannon. Smaller providers tend to have small candidate and completer numbers. How did you address this issue in your quality assurance system and data reporting? I definitely think that this is a challenge that small EPPs have. And I think that there are lots of ways around it. I think for us, what really made a lot of sense was taking a look at some of our smaller initial programs and deciding how we could aggregate that data to make an informed decision. So we all know when we're analyzing data, if we have an N of two, we really can't make big decisions about the curriculum or the program because we're working with such a small number. So what we decided to do was try to pair like areas and decide how we could aggregate data to help us think about what that meant about the program itself. And so we initially certify in chemistry and physics and biology. And we did that at the middle school and high school level. So we decided to aggregate that data so that we would have a larger end size to think about as we were moving through our key assessment and proprietary assessment data. And then we would take a look at things like Spanish or French or English language arts or journalism, try to partner those together as well. So that was really helpful for us in our middle and high school areas, mostly because our largest programs were elementary education and special education. So those could generally stand on their own, but as we moved into some of those finer, smaller areas, we had to think about what we were going to do to make sense of the data for quality assurance purposes. The other thing we did in terms of completers is really think about how we were going to continue our relationships with our district partners. And so we all know that sometimes candidates stay in touch with us when they leave and sometimes they don't. And so in order for us to really stay in touch with our completers specifically to meet the expectations for standard four, we were looking at everything that we had in terms of our MOUs and relationships with our partner districts and we continue to stay in touch with them. So it wasn't just about how the district could serve us and our teacher candidates during the preparation 
or practicum phases, or even the culminating internship. It was about the continued relationship after our graduates left us and were hired in those districts. And we use those relationships to leverage our continued conversations with completers as we move through the process. Thank you, Tracy. Well, very similar to, to Shannon, we, um, we do try and use that small size as an asset and not a liability. Um, so looking at things like if you're trying to use a survey that you're going to get a low response rate on and minimal numbers to be able to draw data conclusions on, looking something more like a case study. Um, in our state, we have um, a resident educator program where there's a portfolio assessment as you're a new teacher and we're looking at asking our students to share those results with us as an indicator of their success. So we get a more representative sample because we know our students and, and they still text us and reach out to us and share their successes with us. And so we can ask them for that for that. We can make a phone call and get those case studies and look at it more individually as a representation of all of our programs versus trying to get a survey sample um, again, for standard four. Standard four, I think, tends to be problematic for a lot of um, how small EPPs try and approach some of the traditional, traditional examples that a, a larger EPP might have access to. So using it as an asset and not a liability. Thanks, Tracy. Melina, I think Tracy's raising a great point about small sometimes being an asset as you're going through CAPE. And you have the benefit of having seen a lot of small providers and worked with them going through. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe even in relation to standard four? Yeah, so actually, you know, as, as I was thinking about um, all the reports that I've read, um, some of the best um, site visit reports and accreditation reports I've read have been from small institutions. And I think um, the reason for that is because um, they see themselves in the standards so they take the standards instead of um, trying to um, think about, well, I can't do this, or this is gonna be a problem. They really try and see what they currently do and how that fits into the standards and how they can, they can adapt what they do to, to meet the standards. And so I think um, in doing that, they really make it their own process. And so they become much stronger in, um, in, their, in their evidences and the way they present themselves, um, how they're meeting the components and standards. And so I think that that is, uh, again, um, a positive and not a, a liability like, like Tracy was talking about. The fact that you know all of your candidates, the fact that they will respond to you because they know you personally um, is, is, a, is a giant um, positive. Um, for some of the big EPPs, you know, and you could send out a, a, an email or a request for information. And if there's a thousand people you're sending it to, they might not respond to you or know who you are. But if you have five or six, they generally do know who you are and will respond and will do anything you know, for your EPP. They, 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 they're proud of where they, they graduated from and they generally wanna participate and support the EPP um, any way they can. So, so we see a lot of, um, I think, strength in the, in the small EPPs because they do have those connections with LEAs, their completers, their candidates. Um, and so that's, that's really a positive. Um, one of the other sort of pieces is um, in, in seeing yourself in the standards is not um, making assumptions about what the requirement is. So for standard four, a uh, perfect example is that there's not a reference to surveys in, in the completer satisfaction or employer satisfaction. It's, it doesn't specifically say you have to use a survey. So don't try and fit something that doesn't fit into your culture into uh, just to meet the standard, right? So think about other ways. Uh, maybe a focus group is a much more effective way to gather information for your for your um, completers or your candidates. Maybe interviews, maybe, you know, uh, there, there's lots of different ways to gather that information that maybe wouldn't uh, involve a survey because that's not going to be a successful way um, if you only have, you know, 10 or 12 folks that you need to get information from and then you only have one or two participate in the survey, but you probably could get a whole, you know, probably the population if you were really wanted to of those 10 candidates to participate in a focus group or, a, or an interview situation. So, so really seeing yourself in the standards, I think is a, is a positive and um, serves you well in the accreditation process. Very, very helpful. Thanks. Thanks, Melina. We'll go to question four. Tracy, we'll start with you. What do you think are, are the benefits of CAPE accreditation and, and why, why did you pursue it? Well, so we are 
um, required to pursue CAPE accreditation, as many of us are, and but um, that wouldn't have stopped our institution from pursuing CAPE accreditation. Um, so when I think about this question, I do think about the word accountability. And so as a small EPP, um, as many of you do, we wear multiple hats and have multiple responsibilities and, and are juggling so many projects at any given time, and it's easy to push something to the back burner. So CAPE accreditation does help us keep those important components towards the front, or at least see how other projects that we're working on um, benefit, benefit the program as part of CAPE accreditation because they all do fit together. Um, so really providing that sense of accountability and self-reflection, looking at our program, um, finding the holes. So as we were preparing our interim advance report, um, as we were putting the pieces together, we saw some things that were starting to slip and maybe someone forgot that they were supposed to be doing. And so that's that sense of accountability of following and closing that loop that, hey, this has to happen. Here's why it has to happen. This is an important piece of data and we need to make sure uh, that it's happening on a regular basis. Um, so that piece of accountability. And again, um, as a volunteer, getting to see other programs, uh, I like participating with CAPE because it provides a sense of inspiration where you get to see what other people are doing um, and not, we would never just steal something that someone else was doing, but it, it provides a sense of creativity um, so where you were stuck on how to implement a certain thing, you might see how someone else is doing it or something you didn't think you could do, you now see another small EPP doing. So you know it's feasible um, and you get the chance often as a reviewer or connecting with different collaborative models. I love hearing about the, uh, the cohort model uh, to be able to say, how are you making this work? We're trying something like that. It's not really working for us. Um, but so that sense of inspiration uh, and, and again, uh, I, to beat a dead horse, but the accountability portion of it is huge for us. Thanks, Shannon. I would certainly agree accountability is key. Uh, we can't operate quality assurance systems on a hunch. Uh, we have to be data driven in the decisions that we make. And so for us, this whole idea of accreditation is recognizing what pieces we need to put in place guided by CAPE to help us really think about our programs in a purposeful way. So we may think that our candidates are doing well in our particular in-task standard, but unless we know because we're looking at the data, then we really can't make informed decisions. And so I am from a state where our pursuit of CAPE accreditation is optional. And as a small EPP, we absolutely have some folks who would say, well, if we have the choice. But when we got together as faculty and realized what the value was by really scrutinizing everything that we do from field and clinical to how we address our completers to what's happening with quality assurance, all of that became really critical in making sure that we were the best teacher education program we could be. And so we fought for it and we worked hard and we leveraged it and we made it work for us. And I think as a result of that for us, it became a recruitment tool. And so we can say, we're the institution who chose to go after this because we wanted to prove to you that not only were we capable of doing it, but that we could be analyzed at this level and come out successfully. And so for us, it's about convincing folks to enter our teacher education preparation program because we're really thoughtful about what we do because we use data to drive our decisions. It holds us accountable. Uh, it holds uh, the quality of our programs accountable. And I think because of that, we're crafting those kind of teacher candidates into the educators we want and need them to be. You're both raising great um, points about the dual purpose of accreditation, and, which is accountability and continuous improvement. And Melina, prior to coming to CAPE, you worked for a larger institution that went through CAPE accreditation, and you also served as a volunteer. And I know you served on a variety of different types of institutions. What do you hear from them then and even from since coming to CAPE as to the value of why they pursued it and what they get out of it? So I think one of the, the more common things I hear is that it's kind of like a, a boot camp analogy that when they're going through it, they, they might not see the, the light at the end of the tunnel, but when they're, when they're finished, 
they realized how important it was and, and how it helped them to, um, to be a better program. Um, you know, overall to look at their data a different way, to have processes in place that support high quality, um, that they have high quality uh, completers out in the field and that they're, they're producing the, be the best teachers that they can. And so, you know, being able to, to look back and say, I'm really glad I did that because it really helped me focus on the areas that, that needed work. Um, and, and if you don't go through that process, I think Tracy mentioned it a little earlier, you know, there are a lot of things that kind of slip away and they, they don't, they're not as important. And it's, it's difficult sometimes to look at your own um, kind of areas for improvement and say, we really need to fix this and to have an independent voice tell you, you know, this is something that, that needs to be fixed and, and you know that and, and to, you know, provide some process around that and data collection and at the end of the day, being able to say, we went from here to here and this was our improvement and this is how we're documenting it. I think one of the other sort of bigger um, key pieces is being able to have information, um, solid data and information. So when people say things like your state tells you or other entities say, you know, teacher preparation is X, Y, and Z, you can say, no, no, wait, I have data that says these programs are doing well, or I have information and it's not just anecdotal or, um, you know, well, I think like, like Shannon said, I, I think my candidates are good. No, I know they're good. And this is how I know they're good. Right. So having that support, that data to support that, um, those, those comments is always um, very helpful. And so your legislature, your uh, other EPPs, um, you know, when rankings come out, all, the, all those kinds of things, you know, it's a way to, to have that independent voice um, support the work that you're doing. So that's, I think, a, a key um, factor. And then I do think some EPPs, um, you know, it is, it's for recruiting and it's also for um, the fact that there are a lot of areas that have lots of EPPs. Right, candidates have choices about where they're going to go, and that puts you one level up. If you if you can say, you know, we're nationally accredited, we went through this process, um, you know, and, and here are the things that we need to work on, and here are the things we do well. I think that that bodes well for for not only your recruitment but for your co competition among other EPPs that are you know preparing teachers in your area. So I think those are the things that, that I'm hearing from the field. Um, me personally, from uh, my EPP experience. It was a way that um, I, I had a way of talking to programs and, and my EPP with data to support why I needed certain things, right? So if I needed um, you know, funding for something or we needed to support um, a program in a certain way, I could go to the provost or I could go to the dean um, with um, my data in hand and say, this is why we need these things or this is, you know, this is the outcome of the investment you made um, two years ago. In, in our program, here is the outcome and, and actually have data to review and look at. And so it was a definitely a leverage point within the institution um, as a whole, um, you know, to, to, uh, to talk about the, the good things that we do and to, and to leverage that into support for programs. Thanks, um, Lena. I've also heard it does help uh, deans often focus faculty around common goals and also to highlight things they do well. CAPE does provide a press packet to those who go through accreditation uh, after the Accreditation Council makes decisions. And uh, we definitely see 100% use of that in local media. And we think that's uh, you know, something that helps providers. Uh, also on our website, we have CAPE Voices where a number of providers, faculty and deans talk about their experiences of going through and why they did it and the value it brought. And that can be viewed at www.capenet.org. Um, also, Shannon had mentioned the CapeCon. That is going to be virtual this year on March 16th. And you can register at that same web address. Are there any other points any panelists would like to raise of uh, points you'd like to bring in before we close for questions? OK. Thank you all for your participation today on the panel and we look forward to answering any questions you might have.